Wind in the Willows, Chapter 4, Mr. Badger, Part 2. The front doorbell clanged loudly, and the rat, who was very greasy with buttered toast, sent Billy, the smaller hedgehog, to see who it might be. There was a sound of much stamping in the hall, and presently Billy returned in front of the otter, who threw himself on the rat with an embrace and a shout of affectionate greeting. Get off, spluttered the rat with his mouth full. Thought I should find you here all right, said the otter cheerfully. They were all in a great state of alarm along the river bank when I arrived this morning. Rat never been home all night, nor mole either. Something dreadful must have happened, they said, and the snow had covered up all your tracks, of course. But I knew that when people were in any fix, they mostly went to Badger, or else Badger got to know of it somehow. So I came straight off here, through the wild wood and the snow. My, it was fine coming through the snow as the red sun was rising and showing against the black tree trunks. As you went along, in the stillness, every now and then, masses of snow slid off the branches suddenly with a flop, making you jump and run for cover. Snow castles and snow cabins had sprung up out of nowhere in the night, and snow bridges, terraces, ramparts. I could have stayed and played with them for hours. Here and there, great branches have been torn away by the sheer weight of the snow, and robins perched and hopped on them in their perky, conceited way, just as if they had done it themselves. A ragged string of wild geese passed overhead, high on the grey sky, and a few rooks whirled over the trees, inspected and flapped off homewards with a disgusted expression but I met no sensible being to ask the news of. About halfway across, I came on a rabbit sitting on a stump, cleaning his silly face with his paws. He was a pretty scared animal when I crept up behind him and placed a heavy forepaw on his shoulder. I had to cuff his head once or twice to get any sense out of it at all. At last, I managed to extract from him that Mole had been seen in the wild wood last night by one of them but it was the talk of the burrows. He'd said how Mole, Mr. Rat's particular friend, was in a bad fix, how he'd lost his way, and they were up and out hunting and were chiving him around and round. Then why didn't you do something, I asked. You may, mayn't be blessed with brains, but there are hundreds and hundreds of you big stout fellows as fat as butter and your burrows running in all directions you could have taken him in and made him safe and comfortable, or tried to, at all events. What, us? he merely said. Do something? Us rabbits? So I cuffed him again, left him. There was nothing else to be done. At any rate, I had learnt something, and if I had had the luck of meeting any of them, I'd have learnt something more, or they would. Weren't you at all uh, nervous? asked the mole, some of yesterday's terror coming back to him at the mention of the wild wood. Nervous? The wild otter showed a gleaming set of strong white teeth and as he laughed. I'd give him nerves if any of them tried anything on with me. Here, mole, fry me some slices of ham, like the good little chap you are. I'm frightfully hungry and I haven't got, and I've got, an, I've got any amount to say to Ratty here. Haven't seen him for an age. So the good-natured mole, having cut some slices of ham, sent the hedgehogs to fry it and returned to his own breakfast while the otter and rat, their heads together, eagerly talked river shop, which is long shop, and talk, that is, endless, running like the babbling river itself. A plate of fried ham had just been cleared and sent back for more when the badger entered, yawning and rubbing his eyes. He greeted them in all in his quiet, simple way, with kind inquiries for everyone. It must be getting on for luncheon time, he remarked to the otter. Better stop and have it with us. You must be hungry this cold morning. Rather, replied the otter, winking at the mole. The sight of these greedy young hedgehogs stuffing themselves with fried ham makes me feel positively famished. The hedgehogs, who were just beginning to feel hungry again after their porridge, and after working so hard at frying, looked timidly up at Mr. Badger, but were too shy to say anything.
Here, you two youngsters, be off home to your mother, said the badger kindly. I'll send someone with you to show you the way. You won't want any dinner today. I'll be bound. He gave them a sixpence apiece and pat on the head, and they went off with much respectful swinging of their caps and touching of forelocks. Presently, they all sat down to luncheon together. The mole found himself next to Mr. Badger, and as the other two were still deep in river gossip from which nothing could divert them, he took the opportunity to tell Badger how comfortable and homelike it all felt for him. Once while underground, he said, you know exactly where you are. Nothing can happen to you. Nothing can get at you. You're entirely your own master and you don't have to consult anybody or mind what they say. Things go on all the same overhead and you let them and you don't bother about them. And um, when you want to go up, you go up and there are things there, things are waiting for you. The badger simply beamed on at him. That's exactly what I say, he replied. There's no security or peace, of, peace and tranquility except underground. And then if your ideas get larger and you want to expand, why a dig and a scrape? And there you are. If you feel your house is a bit too big or you stop up a hole or two, and there you are again. No builders, no tradesmen, no remarks passed on by your fellows looking over your wall and above all, no weather. Look at Rat now. A couple of feet of flood water and he's got to move in to hired lodgings. Uncomfortable, inconveniently situated and horribly expensive. Take Toad. I say nothing against Toad Hall. Um, Hall. Quite the, the best house in these parts as a house. But supposing a fire breaks out, where's Toad? Supposing tiles are blown off or walls sink or crack or windows get broken, where's Toad? Supposing the rooms are drafty, I hate a draft. Myself, where's Toad? No up and out of the doors is good enough to roam about and get one's living in, but underground to come back to at last, that's my idea of home. The mole assented heartily and the badger with inconsequence got very friendly with him. When lunch is over, he said, I'll take you all around this little place of mine. I can see you'll appreciate it. You understand what domestic architecture ought to be. After luncheon, accordingly, when the other two had settled themselves into the chimney corner and had started a heated argument on the subject of eels, the badger lightened, uh, lighted a lantern and bade the mole to follow him. Crossing the hall, they passed down one of the principal tunnels and wavering light of the lantern gave glimpses on either side of rooms, both large and small, some near cupboards, others nearly as broad and imposing as Toad's dining hall. A narrow passage at right angles led them into an, another corridor and here the same thing was repeated. The mole was staggered at the size and extent of the ramifications of it all, and at the length of the dim passages, the solid vaultings, the crammed store chambers, the masonry everywhere, the pillars, the arches, the pavements. How on earth, Badger, he said at last, did you ever find the time and strength to do all of this? It's astonishing. It would be astonishing indeed, said the Badger simply, if I had done it. But as a matter of fact, I did none of it, only cleaned out the passages and chambers as far as I need of them. There's a lot more of it all around about. I see you don't understand and I must explain it to you. Well, very long ago, on the spot where the wild wood waves now, before it had ever, ever, before ever it had planted itself and grown up to what it now is, there was a city, a city of people, you know, here where we are standing, they lived, they walked and talked and slept and carried on their business. Here they stabled their horses, feast and feasted. And from here they rode out to fight or drove to, out to trade. They were powerful people and rich and great builders. They built to last for they thought their city would last forever. But what has become of them? Asked the mole. Who can tell, said the badger. 
People come, they stay for a while, they flourish, they build and they go. It's their way, but we remain. There were badgers here, I've been told, long before the same city ever came to be. And now there are badgers here again. We are an enduring lot and we may move out for a time, but we will wait and are patient and back we come. And so it will ever be well. And when they went at last, those people, said the mole, when they went, continued the badger, the strong winds and persistent rains took the matter in hand patiently and ceaselessly year after year. Perhaps we badgers too in our small way helped a little. Who knows? It was all down, 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 gradually, ruin and levelling and disappearance. And then it was all up, 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 gradually, as seeds grew to saplings and saplings to forest trees and bramble and fern came creeping in to help. Leaf mould rose and obliterated um, steams, streams in their winter fresh freshets brought sand and soil to clog and to cover and in the course of time our home was ready for us again and we moved in. Up above us on the surface the same thing ha had happened. Animals arrived, liked the look of the place, took up their quarters, settled down, spread and flourished. They didn't bother themselves about the past, they never do. They're too busy. The place was a bit humpy and hillocky. Naturally, the full and, and full of holes, but that was rather an advantage. And they don't bother about the future either. The future one, perhaps the people will move in again. And for a time, it, it as may very well be, the wildwood is pretty well populated by now. With all the usual lot, good, bad and indifferent, I name no names. It takes all sorts to make a world, but I fancy, you know, something about them yourself by this time. I do indeed, said the mole with a slight shiver. Well, well, said the badger, patting him on the shoulder. It was your first experience of them. You see, they're not so bad, really, and we must all live and let live. But I'll pass the word around tomorrow, and I think you'll have no further trouble. Any friend of mine walks wherever he likes in this country, or I'll know the reason why. They got back to the kitchen again and found the rat walking up and down very restlessly. The underground atmosphere was oppressing him and getting on his nerves, and he seemed really to be afraid that the river would run away if he wasn't there to look after it. So he had his overcoat on and his pistols thrust into his belt again. Come along, Mole, he said anxiously. As soon as he caught sight of them, we must get off while it's daylight. We don't want to spend another night in the wildwood again. It'll be fine, my f uh, all right, my fine fellow, said the otter. I'm coming with you, along with you, and I know every bath path blindfolded. And if there's a head that needs to be punched, you can confidently rely upon me to punch it. You needn't fret, Ratty, added the badger placidly. My passages run further than you think, and I've bolt holes to the edges of the wood in several directions, though I don't care for everybody to know about them. When you really have to go, you shall lead by one of my shortcuts. In the meantime, make yourself easy and sit down. The rat was nevertheless still anxious to be off and attend to his river, so the badger, taking up his lantern, led the way along a damp and airless tunnel that wound and dipped, part vaulted, part hewn, through solid rock for a weary distance that seemed to be miles. At last, daylight began to show itself confusedly through tangled overgrowth overhanging um, the mouth of the passage and the badger bidding them a hasty goodbye pushed them hurriedly through the opening, made everything look as natural as possible, again with creepers, brushwood and dead leaves, and retreated. They found themselves standing on the very edge of the wild wood, rocks and brambles, the tree roots behind them, confusedly heaped and tangled. In front, a great space of quiet fields hemmed by lines of hedges, black on the snow and far ahead a glint of the familiar old river 
while the wintry sun hung red and low on the horizon. The otter, as knowing all the paths, took charge of the party and they trailed out on the beeline for a distant stile. Pausing there a moment and looking back, they saw the whole mass of the wild wood, dense, menacing, compact, grimly set in a vast white surroundings. Simultaneously, they turned and made swiftly for home, for firelight and the familiar things it played on, the voice sounding cheerily outside their window, of the river that they knew and trusted in its moods that never made them afraid with any amazement. As he hurried along, eagerly anticipating the moment when he knew um, when he would be at home again among the things that he knew and liked, the mole saw clearly that he was an animal of tilled field and hedgerow, linked to the ploughed furrow and frequented pasture, the lane of evening lingerings, the cultivated garden plot. For others and asperities, the stubborn endurance or the clash of actual conflict that went with nature in the rough. He must be wise, must be, keep to the pleasant places in which his lines were laid and which held adventure enough in their way to last for a lifetime.